It's talking about the end of the world. And Jesus had a little bit to say about this in Matthew 13. Jesus said the field is the world. He's talking about a parable that he told about the seeds and the farmers. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. The enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the harvesters are the angels. But have a look back in Revelation 14. There's another angel with another sickle. Another angel came out of the temple. He too had a sharp sickle. Have I got that there? Still another angel who had charge of the fire came out from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. See, there's two gatherings at the end. Notice it doesn't call it a harvest. Very interested in that this week. The harvest is God, God harvesting the seeds he planted, right? That's what we do. I'm learning all about this now, my new job. <laughs> we put things in the ground and we harvest. And I, first I wrote, you know, the second harvest, but it doesn't say it's a harvest, but it does say it's a gathering. But it is a serious business, isn't it? This is life and death. So there's two things going on, and I found out here God's a gardener. God's a grower, isn't he? In fact, he's the grower. <laughs> Have a look at 1 Corinthians 3, 7. Did I put that there? So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And I'm absolutely amazed this week, you know, we're flat out harvesting this week. We just put these little spindly plants in the ground. They look like they were dead for quite a while because the sun baked them. And this week we've been pulling out tumors like this. And there would be like three or four on one plant. And we didn't do any of that. God is the one that makes things grow. And God's expecting a harvest. He planted the seed. There was another verse. I don't think I put it in there. Luke 8. 11. It's an interesting comparison, actually, Matthew 13 and Luke 8, 11. Matthew's um, description of it was the seed represented God's people. And Luke says here in verse 11, the seed is what? The word of God. Interesting, eh? There's no contradiction between those two. You realize that? Because the seed God plants <coughs> is his word, plants it in his people, and they become seed, don't they? Thank you, Dave, for your prayer. Our mission is sharing the good things we have, the good news we have. The main thing is the good news we have, right? But all the good things that God's blessed us with as well. So the word of God is is the, is the seed, and his people are the seed. God's looking for fruit. <coughs> he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, you'll find this. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit, notice it says the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. In fact, some writers have said, some preachers have said, there should be a colon after love, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Love looks like this, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I like that. That may be right how it should have been written. Contrast, if you will. Did I put that in? Contrast, if you will, the verses before. Galatians 5. Verse 
Uh, verses 19 to 21. <coughs> The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Interesting contrast. He doesn't call the sinful acts fruit, but they are. I wonder why he says that. The good thing that people do, do, the good things are fruit of the spirit. The bad things people do are acts of the flesh. Interesting. And Paul goes to say what? Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature. There's two statements. Let me go back. Sorry, let me read that for you. The object of the Christian life is fruit bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer. That's a great statement, isn't it? Christ's character looks like that, doesn't it? Would you say that describes his character? I think so. And another statement um, of that great writer, Alan White, says, the garment, he, he talks about it in another sense of the a garment of his righteousness, right? He gives us his character. And in that garment, there's not one thread of human devising. And I think that's why it's called fruit. You think about these fruit, you know, how much human input was there in designing them? making them, growing them. We didn't even think of it. There's not one thread of human devising in fruit. It's interesting, all right? <coughs> this change that we're talking about, becoming a Christian, is going from selfishness to selflessness. So let's go back there. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world, a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. <coughs> we don't seem to be doing so well at this. But here's another statement from Christ's Object Lessons, a great book. Probably my favourite of hers. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as, as his own. Those two statements are kind of related, aren't they? For the gospel to be preached around the world, imagine how quickly it would happen if Christ's character was perfectly reproduced in us. It's a great goal. How well are you doing? It seems impossible, doesn't it? But remember, it's fruit. It's not something you can generate yourself. It's what Christ plants in you when you accept him as your saviour. Paul says this. Hang on, I'm just jumping ahead of myself. So the acts of the flesh are the things we do. The fruit of the spirit is what's produced when Christ comes into your heart, right? I was interested to notice those two harvests. One was wheat. And one was grapes. And you think grapes are good, but um, all through scripture, as I read, grapes and wine are associated with corruption, in, as well as other things. But when it comes to the judgment, 
the grape, the harvesting of the grape, not the harvesting, but the gathering of the grapes at the end to go to the winepress of God's wrath. Fascinating. And one of the only reasons I could think of was I learned that the wheat harvest is in, was in April, May. The grape harvest was June, July. See, just after? And I think time ran out. You know, we talk about probation closing. It doesn't mean these are bad people. It just means they didn't do anything about it in time. Time will run out, won't it? So character development is our mission now. Let's have a look at Paul. Paul the Apostle seemed to understand the principle of how to be, be a Christian. And I don't know if you've read Romans lately, but what a powerful book. And Galatians, we looked at Galatians last week, it was a great sermon here, about when he confronted Peter. But as you read on, he says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a great way the King James puts it, not by faith in the Son of God, but by the faith of the Son of God. See, even that faith is not mine. <laughs> it's amazing. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's Galatians 5. I die daily, Paul says. Romans 6, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And that's why we come every week, isn't it? To be encouraged in our new life. Romans 8, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if you, by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And I'll put this one in for all of you who, are like me, looking at a tombstone very close to you. <laughs> but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life, give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Death's not even a problem, is it? Why be afraid of it? The death of the body is nothing compared to missing eternal life. Uh, this is the verse I wanted to focus on for a while. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Can I have any volunteers to tell me what it means? Do you find it quite challenging, this verse? If while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? There's two things happening, isn't there? Reconciliation, salvation. They're not the same. They're kind of connected and related, but they're not the same. As you receive Christ the life of Christ the character of Christ that I showed you you're saved right salvation is not really having your sins forgiven is it that's only the beginning and Jesus death on the cross did that completely all of your bad past has been forgiven we just got to accept his death for us and we're reconciled to God. He treats us as if we'd never sinned. But then salvation starts. And by his life transferred to you, we're saved. Amazing transaction. Christ's death on the cross equals reconciliation. Christ's life in you equals salvation. And uh Dave almost quoted this in his prayer. As you receive the Spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. It's interesting, isn't it? 
The spirit of Christ equals the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others. You will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. I've certainly found that um, if you want to work with Jesus, go where he works. And he's always working where people have needs. And um, some of us who don't get so much of an opportunity these days because we're busy with our work, we can miss sometimes. But if you deliberately go where there's a need, you'll find Jesus there. you find he works through you. It's absolutely amazing. And um, some of you find that in your everyday work as well. You're meeting people all the time. This is a verse we read last week, Jesus' prayer. And, and the pastor said, go home and read John 17. <laughs> this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And knowing him is a big word, isn't it? It seems simple, but to know him. So we have the privilege, not of trying to make ourselves good, but of getting to know him. And he'll make us good. What a blessing the gospel is. And I uh, invite you to join me as we sing praise. Hymn number 560. And I invite the musicians back. Thank you. It's a hymn you mightn't have sung so much, but uh, it's a very famous tune. If you're English, you'll know it. <laughs> British, should I say, Ian? <laughs> Yes, Father, we give you praise for the wonderful gospel of salvation, for sending your Son, who loved us so much, that he would come and become a human, live the life of a man on earth, and, and make provision that we can have eternal life. But not only that, he gives us his character. And Lord, some of us know the joy of salvation, some of us don't. Please... Let us crucify the things of the flesh and understand what it means to live that life, growing fruit that you, only you can produce. So we give our lives over to you again today, and uh, may we 
Remember every day to die to self, to live for you. Thank you in Jesus' name.